Hi, I'm, good morning, and uh, I'm Representative Mike Intachka. I represent Charlotte and part of Heinsburg. And uh, I'm on the Energy and Technology Committee, and I'm Vice Chair of this committee. Um, so I think, first of all, we should have some introductions, so we'll start with you, Lauren. Sure, I'm Lauren Glendavidian. I'm the Executive Director of CCTV Center for Media and Democracy and a member of Vermont Access Network, the statewide organization for the 25 Access Centers in Vermont. And I'm Andrea Papiti. I am a utilities analyst for the Public Utility Commission, and I'm serving on this committee uh, on behalf of the commission. I'm Clay Purvis uh, with the Department of Public Service, and I am serving on this committee as a member of the Department of Public Service. Uh, good morning. I'm Dan Glanville. I work with Comcast, and I'm serving on the committee as an industry representative. And we have two other members of the committee who will can't be here today, and that's uh, our chair, uh, Senator Rebecca Balin, and um, uh, Karen Horn, who represents the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. So uh, we'll start with uh, just a notation that we're going to have a public hearing on 1016, as required by statute, and that will be at 10 to 12 p.m. On, in room 10 at the State House, and that will be followed by a committee meeting. Uh, from 1 to 3.30 p.m. in the same room. So uh, that's for everybody's awareness. And uh, <clears throat> so the rest of the agenda will have public comments for anybody who wants to speak. Uh, we'll go through the AMO financials and revenue forecast. Um, we'll get an update on the Com Comcast <coughs> CPG. Um, and uh, then we'll look into a number of options that we might be considering for uh, revenue uh, generation for our AMOs. And uh, so let's start with public comments. Does any, would anyone like to speak to uh, the committee? Well, in that case, <laughs> we'll uh, proceed with the uh, first item on the agenda which is the AMO Financials and Revenue Forecast. So we'll have Clay Purvis and uh, Lauren Glenn Devine um, providing us with some information here. Okay. Um, well, I don't actually have much to add. Um, I provided uh, the committee members with uh, some basic financial information that we put together from AMO annual reports that's available on the uh, committee uh, webpage. Uh, as you can see there, uh, this is just basic balance sheet information uh, for each of the AMOs. Um, <clears throat> and I provided it to the committee um, in part so that everyone had some, some numbers to, to go with the, the, the narrative uh, that we've um, been uh, building the last uh, three meetings. Um, and so I'm, I'm hopeful that this is uh, a useful tool. I don't have um, much insight into it other than this is what's reported to us uh, through their annual report. So um, I, I imagine that um, there are conclusions that could be drawn and, and I hope that uh, Lauren Glenn and the AMOs can provide some insight into their meeting. Sure. I, I would defer to Kevin Christopher and Elizabeth Malone just to comment on these numbers. This is one year of revenue. And what year is this uh, represent? This is 2018. So this is the, the most recent financial information we have. So organizations year ends range anywhere from the <coughs> end of December to the end of September. So there could be a, you know, be an 18 month swing in this data. But there was another question that had been asked at the prior meeting about the trend since 2006 is since the cable revenue has increased and 5% of that revenue has also increased to the benefit of Vermont communities through access. And so we did some research into that. And Elizabeth and Kevin have some remarks to make, if that's okay. Hopefully everyone received the memo that went out earlier this week. 
please identify yourself. Oh, I'm you. Elizabeth Malone, the Executive Director for Northwest Access TV in St. Louis. And Kevin Christopher, Executive Director of Lake Champlain Access TV in Colchester, and Van uh, Vermont Access Network Board of Directors President. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, hopefully you got the memo that outlined the changes that the AMOs have made between 2006 and 2018. Um, I guess in the interest of time, if anyone has questions about this, um, please let us know. We outlined changes to services, capital investments, and personnel during that time, as well as talking a little bit about cash reserves. Would you like to recap since there are people in the audience and that have not seen the memo? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so changes to services during this time included expanded service territories um, that include more towns being served by the same AMO. Uh, expansion of production and community coverage has increased by 40%, so that's the number of programs that we produce in a year, up 40%. And of course, while regular business costs are rising, we've continued to offer the same and expanded services to those areas. Capital investments that we've made include to production equipment, playback, distribution, and archiving, um, that, that time span when you're talking 12 to 13 years is incredibly long in our field. So equipment regularly has to be replaced in order to keep contemporary with what our producers need and what <coughs> our communities need. And under personnel, uh, during the 12 year period, there's been a 70% increase in the number of full-time employees that are working with the community uh, to produce shows and also train them to produce shows for themselves. And we've also increased compensation throughout our organizations uh, to a more livable wage. And finally, I think everyone that looks at a budget uh, sees how much things, uh, benefit costs have been going up, uh, especially health insurance over those years. But we're very committed, you know, as a community-minded organization to maintaining good benefits for our staff. Do you want to talk a little bit about reserves? Uh, yeah. Um, so just a few words about, uh, you see from um, Clay's spreadsheet that uh, there are AMOs with cash on hand and reserves uh, and um, some considerable cash assets. Uh, there's a few drivers for this. Um, uh, a lot of us will uh, bank um, funds for major capital purchases. If we're talking about a uh, video server system, for example, that can be an expense upwards of $50,000, which might not fit into a regular <coughs> capital, uh, annual capital budget. So uh, it's good to have cash on hand uh, for that sort of purchase. Um, a couple of us uh, here at this table have had uh, facility relocations within that period. So there was a lot of uh, banking for that, saving up for that, and then uh, huge capital outputs um, when that happened. I, I think around the state we have been cognizant of uh, both last year with the uh, gap reclassifications that I think this committee addressed earlier and uh, with what's been going on at a federal level, um, cognizant of the fact that our funding uh, is being impacted and could be further impacted uh, in the next few years and looking to maintain operations at some semblance of, of what they look like now. So in, in, in terms of that, um, putting more reserves aside than we would normally uh, uh, do so that we can continue to provide services and maintain the staffing that we have now uh, for as long as possible in the face of, of whatever is to come. Okay, so I have a couple questions. <clears throat> uh, so this re reflects 2018 uh, numbers. Um, this is prior to any changes the FCC made in terms of how the funding goes, right? Yeah. Now, when you have um, some of the AMOs with, who are running deficits here and others that have some surpluses, when you talk about a reserve fund, is that what these surpluses represent? Right, yes. They do uh, okay. it, it, for the, the large part, yeah. yeah. Um, is there any revenue sharing among the AMOs? Uh, for instance, uh, those that have larger surpluses, do they help out the ones that are running deficits at all? 
Um, I don't know of any overlap like that. I think we've mentioned before um, the <coughs> partnership between um, Vermont Community Access Media and RETN in Burlington and uh, their uh, collective efforts. So I think, and I, I would defer to RETN's executive director who's behind me, but I think there's possibly some revenue sharing between those two organizations, or not yet. No, there, um, we are sharing some staff, so Thanks I guess staffing. if you could call that revenue sharing perhaps, but we're, we're, we're supporting some staff positions together. But I'm, I'm unaware of any sort of Robin Hood scenarios mm -hmm. where the, the larger centers are helping, financially helping out the um, uh, smaller centers. There are uh, examples of services and, and production that we share, however. I think there's two points to add to that. Um, these organizations that, sh that show a, a loss for the year mm -hmm. all have equity. So they're, they're, they may be spending systematically from their reserves. So that would be the case of Channel 17, for example. So every year we have a loss, but that's a, our way of spending down what was at one time quite a large reserve. So none of these are actually in the red overall, they might be in the red for the year, okay. right? And then I think the second point that's important to make is that the access centers work together and when we, for example, have a litigation, each of the centers contributes to those costs based on their percentage of revenue of the whole that they represent. So it's not cost sharing per se, but it is a kind of mutual aid contribution based on this, the relative size of each of the organizations. So the Burlington or the Rutland organizations will be making a bigger contribution to uh, legal expenses, let's say, or a statewide project than the smaller ones would. Okay. Um, so equity, uh, that column equity, is that cash equity or is that uh, equity in terms of equipment and things like that, capital? It capital looks like equipment. total current. The third column is current assets, which are probably more liquid versus total assets, which are equipment and liquid assets. And then the equity is going to be the difference between the total assets and the liabilities. See how that works. So current. Okay, so total assets would be cash and, and capital. Equipment, yeah. yeah. And if I may, just as an example, like Vermont Access Media, I believe the first column liquid assets really is just cash like that. I think that represents a money market fund if I'm not mistaken, so that's you know 1.3 million, okay. um, and then other current are, uh, I guess, are classified as things that uh, you know um, are somewhat liquid uh, or assets that can be turned into cash quickly. Mm -hmm. Can we better define what liquid is? Is that something that you can draw on? Well, it's a gap standard. In other words, if you look on a balance sheet, <coughs> which we could draw up one. Um, you'll see that the, the liquid assets are going to be maybe money markets, maybe payroll accounts. Okay, they tend you. to be cash. And then the, um, what you could cash in if you had to close the business is, so we maintain, for example, a current, um, current ratio, which is the, the current assets that you could liqui liquidify quickly or are liquid over the money that you owe for that month or year. So that's... So anyway, in any event, liquid and current is going to go into this third column, current assets. Okay. Can I ask one more follow-up question? Uh, in the uh, net income loss, is this mm -hmm. a, if you compare this to 16 or 17, is this similar to what you would see? And what, what uh, uh, influence did the gap change have on this particular year? Gap change was about a half a million dollar drop in revenue. Okay. And you would see it the next year, probably not this year, not here. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> when just for clarification, when you when you're talking about gap <coughs> excuse me. When you're talking about gap it's general accounting practices and are are you ref using that to refer to the changes that the FCC made or is No, that is separate. So uh, separate. the FCC docket is over here under FCC regulation. 
the gap, Dan could probably explain it better, but it was a reclassification of, of cable operators. Well, actually, it was, an, it was a change in accounting practices for how revenue is classified, which resulted in a change in what the 5% franchise fee was set against. Okay. And the, the net effect was a half a million dollar drop statewide for the access centers. And it had to do with the, how cable services are bundled and how they're priced and how the accountants wanted those bundled services to be priced. Um, all right. Any other questions on this particular agenda? <coughs> item? And we had a PUC workshop on that question. We went into it pretty detailed. So we looked at that. Yeah. Anything you wanted to add? Thanks for doing all that research. Appreciate it. CPG update uh, for the podcast, uh, CPG. Um. Great, thank you. Uh, we filed uh, with the PUC. Uh, that file is before them for uh, consideration. Uh, it will resolve all of the pending issues uh, that were appealed. Uh, we think satisfactorily to all of the uh, parties involved. Uh, so we're waiting for uh, a decision on that matter. Uh, there's also a piece that was outlined in uh, the, the provision that will have a uh, outlay of dollars as well associated with this. Uh, greater than a half million dollars uh, are associated with it and are outlined in specifics uh, in the filing. Uh, we hope to have this uh, resolved soon. Uh, clearly, if there are any questions, we stand uh, ready as parties uh, to respond to those questions. So, um, is this an agreement that's already been made between the parties? Or? Yeah, so that we, what we had to do, there's a provision uh, under the federal court, uh, which we appealed, in which there was a mandatory mediation peer, uh, procedure. We participated in the mediation procedure uh, with the representative of the PUC, uh, with the representative of, representatives of VAN and Comcast, and we had three sessions, three day-long sessions, uh, where we negotiated over the terms and conditions. We came to agreement on those terms and conditions. The main area was some funding issues, uh, the build-out requirements, uh, the interactive program guide, uh, and what we call return lines uh, uh, that allow for live remote origination programming uh, to take place for, from the ALRs. <coughs> we were able to satisfactorily resolve all of those issues we signed a settlement agreement early in the summer. Uh, we put together a filing, which was filed just a little over a week ago at the uh, PUC. Uh, and they're taking it up for consideration. Okay. Any comments from uh, Van? Um, we could send that. There's a kind of summary document that we could share with the committee. So we could post here in the materials that really sums up, you know, the. The highlights of the, the changes, as Dan often says, when we go into negotiation, a good negotiation is one when not everyone is completely happy at the end. But we um, essentially agreed to move peg channels to a new neighborhood, a new section of the channel lineup, so that each one of those channels could have access to an interactive program guide. That was uh, technically the most efficient and effective way to achieve that. And then Comcast is going to uh, provide rebranding support for those channel changes, but pretty much all of the PEG channels in the state are going to be relocated. So that's a pretty big change next year. Um, regarding remote origination sites, if you would like, for example, to go to the Winiski Senior Center and go live from there, mm -hmm. but Comcast doesn't run, or the cable operator doesn't run by the Senior Center, you could go to the cable operator and say, could you bring us a fee to that location? And they would say either yes, 
or no, it's uh, yes, but we, we have to charge you because of its distance from the plant. So what this agreement does is it provides some resources for an access center to come up with an alternative solution to use the internet or cellular banded solution, for example, rather than an expensive solution that might come from rewiring of the plant, essentially. Okay. So that, um, that compensation is quite helpful. And there's also included in this a, um, the Comcast did not, was not willing to provide HD channels to the access centers. We can start to request those next year. But they did um, offer a statewide high def channel and resources to create a playback system for such a channel. So that's a step forward. So those were really the highlights. And then the build out requirements, um, the state had required, what was it, 500 miles? 550. 550, mm -hmm. and that was reduced to 350. 350. So I, those are the specifics. Do you have anything to add, Clint? No, I think that sums it up. Um, did, and my apologies for um, asking this, if you did cover it. Uh, the the uh, rebranding costs, the specific costs, share a little bit about what, what those costs will cover and how much. Well, to tell the tell everybody we moved. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, so those, I, I forget the number, is it 3500 3, bucks? 3500 per AMO, and we will right. keep, we'll do a dual running of the channels right. for a period of time, I think it's three months, yeah. uh, where it will be on their current channel, as well as their new channel, which will allow for uh, scrolls to run at the bottom or elsewhere on the screen to say, on X date, we'll be moving to a new location. Uh, so three months is a pretty long period of time that will enable people to see where that location is. And the big benefit of this is that currently the, many of the access centers do not have access to the interactive program guide and cannot be handled like a commercial channel. They can't be de de recorded. You can't do an audio find channel 17. And um, in the case, for example, of Burlington and Richmond, if we were to put Burlington City Council on the interactive program guide, it would appear on Richmond's interactive program guide because of the design of the network. So this gives everyone their own channel, which gives them all the functionality of a commercial channel, which is what we were seeking in the docket. And you will be able to use the voice remote, even though today you could say find channel 17 and it would get you there. Oh, you could, okay. Uh, <laughs> other right. channels uh, will have the, uh, we will add a specific wording uh, to enable people to use the voice remote for that purpose. Okay. Thank you. So this um, this is a uh, an agreement with Comcast specifically. There Correct. are other there are other cable companies in the state. How does it affect them? It doesn't. It doesn't affect them at all. And uh, so will they have to go through a similar uh, CPG? Well, uh, every cable operator goes through. Go ahead. Yeah, every eleven years. Um, well, there are, actually there are a handful of cable companies that are grandfathered, um, but most cable companies uh, go through the CPG process every 11 years. I think Charter was 2013, um, so they were very recent. Um, uh, Waitsfield Champlain Valley's next, so they're you know every 11 years um, we go through this um, same same type of pr proceeding at the PUC and. Um, but Comcast makes up a majority of the the AMOs. You have 20 of the 26 23. AMOs? 23. 25. So that leaves three AMOs for... 22. 22. Or yeah. Four AMOs for uh, the remainder of the state's nine other cable companies. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Okay, so we have um, a statement of the New England Cable and Telecommunications Association to PPG Access Center. Um, is anybody here that want to speak to this? Comcast is a member of NECTA, but we think that the document speaks for itself. Okay. I haven't read it, so. Thank you. 
Is there anything in here that we should uh, be discussing? No, I think we could take it under advisement, and okay. perhaps at the next meeting, when uh, more of our members are present, we could have a discussion pertaining to it, okay. if that's okay with the chair. That's okay with me, if it's okay with other members. Yes, yes. <coughs> yep. Okay, it's okay with um, All right, anything else on the uh, CPG update that anybody wants to talk about? In that case, uh, the next thing we want to do is take a look at various funding options. I think this this implies that we need to come up with a funding option, um, which uh, then leads leads to the question of what do we expect in terms of uh, in terms of uh, a shortfall for the AMOs. Um, with any further changes that have that are that are going to happen in the near future uh, with their funding. I think that there's a bigger question. And the bigger question is that the state's authority to require public benefit from the use of its right of way is being um, reduced by the FCC through various rulings over the past eighteen months to two years. And so the state's ability to accrue any public benefit from use of its rights of way, whether it's through um, PEG or through universal service, um, which is a, obviously a bigger matter, but is connected, means that the state has to look at how its uh, ability to accrue public benefit is changing and to think about new ways that it still has the authority to require public benefit. So if you look at recent FCC rulings, you can see, for example, that the states are, are or the state of Vermont has, their hands are pretty tied when it comes to um, gaining public benefit from internet usage, right? right. And um, <coughs> so that's just one example. There are several, which were outlined in the memo that we put together last at the last meeting. So the question is not that the access revenue is going to go down next year. It's flat, just like cable revenue is flat. It may be slowly going down, but it's pretty flat. So it's not as if the whole thing is going to implode in 24 months. But the state needs to identify, and has said that it wants to, um, ways that it can accrue public benefit from the rights of way. I mean, that's really the question. And so what we've been looking at is models that other uh, municipalities and localities, authorities um, are looking at. Some are looking at sales tax models, <coughs> like the amusement tax in Chicago, for example, or cloud taxes. Some are looking at excise tax models. Some are looking at, um, anyway, so there are a variety of ways that other states, other localities are looking at to recover public benefit. So what we're going to hear today are the different, the sort of the range of authority that the state has, what it has been, what it has been using in terms of taxing or fees to accrue benefit to see if there is some way forward for the state. Okay. So yeah, that's well, yeah, we've talked, uh, the question. in the past uh, about Internet delivery of services as well, so that, apart from the cable delivery of services, that is uh, a, new, a new pathway for programming to get out to the public. And uh, that's what you're referring to. Well, essentially, how, how does, yeah. How, does, how do we make sure that, uh, that the uh, methods of access are reflected in the funding mechanism? Right, and that the states, state exercises what authority it does have, right, to understand what authority it has, how it's exercising it, and how that might be utilized in the future. Right. Okay, so uh, the first option that we uh, talked about as a possibility is a state right of way fees on communication providers. And uh, Agency of Transportation, uh, is Mr. White here? Robert White? Ah, here we go. Welcome. Thank you. For the record, I'm Robert White. I'm the Agency of Transportation Right-of-Way Chief.
understanding is we'd like to talk a little bit about 19 BSA 26A, which is statute that actually talks about the determination of rent that can be charged for leasing or licensing right of way. Um, so let me start by saying that uh, generally fair market value is the term we use uh, for determining any sort of use or rental or fee for using the highway right of way. Um, a part of this statute really talks about other laws and I really want to move more towards the federal law because almost our entire property is federalized and so we move to the federal law to really look to see what they say and they say much of the same thing um, it's a fair market rent I will say that utilities and whatever may be under that definition by federal highway standards is considered an allowed use. Um, and basically what that means is that it allows the states to determine whether they want to allow that use to occur free at some lesser value than fair market value or at fair market value. It's really up to the states. Um, and the federal, um, and actually I can give you the, um, it's a, uh, Title 23 U.S.C. 156 really talks about that fair market value and it states that any fair market value that's gained by the use of that federalized right of way has to be put into what's called a Title 23 fund, which is a fund that we have at the agency. And basically that Title 23 fund specifies that it has to be used for transportation purposes specifically for renewal of the infrastructure, not maintenance. I don't know if there's any questions about... Can we ask a question? Yeah. yeah Wait, can you give some examples of what existing rental licenses or leases are that you have? Um, sure. We have uh, various private entities that may come to us and want to um, rent it. It could be for a short period of time, long-term lease. Um, we do sell property as well, you know, as we do roadway projects and the road may be moved, there may be additional right-of-way. Um, Route 7 is probably a good example where the old Route 7 used to wind down um, through kind of the valley there and it's been straightened out over time. So there is what can be considered surplus property in those locations and so Normally what happens is people come to us, we don't search them out. They'll come to us and say, I've got this use, I want to use it for um, whatever. It could be a, a fair or it could be storage of equipment for a short period of time or something like that. Thank you. So when you talk about uh, transportation purposes, uh, does that include anything other than transportation? For instance, the utilities or you know, the utilities have... Uh, utility poles in the rights of way and how does that tie in? Those aren't considered part of the transportation system. They're not, but they're considered an allowed use. So it's sort of this gray area, right, of it's not transportation, but I think they understand that there is a public benefit potentially there with the utilities. They have a similar uh, need for land, very long linear corridors, much like we do, and so they are allowed to come in. And it doesn't necessarily preclude, like I mentioned, that the state charge anything to those utilities or users of that right-of-way, um, but up to this point, the Agency of Transportation has not charged for the use of that corridor. Okay, so there are no charges at this point. No. How would that, can I ask a question? No. Sorry. How, how would that relationship be constructed. I mean, if the state decided to do that, how, how would that work? Charge. So the way um, use of the right of way is dealt with here in the state is the 1111 permit. So that's of the section 1111 statute um, that requires not only the state but municipal governments as well to enter into this agreement. Basically, the agreement says we're allowing you to occupy this property, when we need it for transportation use, you better move out of the way within the, a timely manner. So we do it under the 1111 permit. So you, so let's say Green Mountain Power has poles in the right-of-way. So that's the right-of-way we're talking about. Yep. So 
So the state would say to Green Mountain Power, we're making an agreement with you. You might have to move the poles, but in the meantime, we want you to pay us fair market value. Can you, I mean, is the fair market value price still apply? I mean, how would the cost of that be figured out? So we don't do that now, right. obviously. Yeah. Um, if we were to determine fair market value, normally there's a, two different ways we can do that under federal guidelines, and that's either a, an appraisal uh, by a, a licensed appraiser, um, or we have a way of determining value which is called waiver valuations, which doesn't really apply here because there's a threshold of $25,000, and it has to be uncomplicated. This is complicated and is probably going to be over that amount. So we would hire an appraiser that has an understanding of those type of facilities, our type of land, and they would do an assessment of the market and determine what that value is. And is there a prohibition from adding a premium onto that cost? I would say no. The federal government actually says we have to charge at a minimum fair market value. So, um, you. utility poles are there now. You're not charging a fee for them. Uh, when a broadband subscriber, uh, the utility poles are there primarily for uh, electrical distribution, right? Clear. Yes. And uh, and uh, landline, probably, right? Yes. So, if depending on who the pole owner is, if it's the utility company, <coughs> they they can charge a fee to broadband providers or for telephone <coughs> providers, right? The, the uh, pole attachment fee. Pole yes. attachment fees, right. Um, if the uh, telephone company is, the, is a pole owner, mm -hmm. they can also charge attachment fees to broadband providers or whatever, right? Correct. And pole attachment fees are <coughs> designed to reimburse the pole owning utility for that portion of the pole that the provider is using and is used for for maintenance of that pole. So and to reimburse for the ongoing operating expenses. Of the, and this of that is pole. totally apart from any right uh, right of way fees because we don't charge right of way fees. Correct. the The pole attachment fee um, is a, an arrangement between the pole owning utility and the attaching entity. And it's it's for the op the operating expenses for maintaining that particular pole to which they're attached. And so if we were to choose this <coughs> option as a funding mechanism, uh, this would be an entirely new fee structure tax to go with the right of way fee. I would say it would be. You know, I do want to point out that you use the word broadband, and I tried not to use that, but when you're talking about broadband or wireless communication specifically, under the same statute, Title 19, VSA 26, um, subsection B, it specifically calls out that infrastructure, broadband and wireless communications, and says that the agency shall charge a reasonable rate. We do not currently but we know this statute is in place and we're trying to wrap our hands around it. Okay. Um, you mentioned that federal guidelines require fair market value so that you have to charge fair market value. Um, are there federal guidelines that, or not guidelines, but rules or statutes that um, govern uh, what happens if a state diverts uh, money from the transportation fund for non-transportation purposes. So let's say this fee is levied, but it's not going to the transportation fund for transportation purposes. Um, is, is there anything that, um, this, uh, does that put the state at risk? It does, and I will say I don't know of specific language about if we don't actually divert that money to the Title 23 fund, but generally, Federal Highway is pretty clear that if you're using a funding mechanism inappropriately, they could potentially pull all Federal Highway funds from the state. 
So there is a risk, however remote, that the, the, we could lose federal funding for highways if we don't use money collected for the right of way for transportation purposes. We could, and I will say we, we have lost money in the past specific to a project, um, but we've never lost <coughs> the entire allotment of federal funds. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Mr. White. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, item is the telephone personal property tax. Uh, we have Doug Farnham from the uh, Farnham Taxes. Yeah. He said he was going to be able to come, but I also put him on the agenda for 11:15, so he might be um, oh. thinking that, that oh, we should really be here at that time. We're, we're probably oh. really we're just running right through this. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, Graham Campbell, who's uh, from the JFO office, uh, testifying this afternoon, had some word changes on the agenda for his topic, so I'm going to distribute those right before this. Okay. <coughs> well, I guess we could either uh, jump ahead to the connection fees, uh, or we could take the time to read the uh, statement that was just given to us. What's your preference? I think we should move ahead to connection fees. Okay. I would second that. All right. Okay, Maria, you're up. Thank you. Thank you. It's just the back page that's changed. There was just some new. Council, and so I'm going to be talking about connection fees. Um, just for background purposes, these are fees that usually come up in the context of financing universal service programs. Um, so, for example, Vermont, like other states, has a state universal service fund. Uh, it funds various <coughs> programs, including uh, relay service for the hearing impaired, the Lifeline program, <coughs> E911 is probably the biggest uh, drawer down of those funds, the Connectivity Initiative, and the High Cost Program. So right now, uh, those programs, that fund, is financed by a surcharge on your phone bill, flat 2% <coughs> fee. Um, it went up actually last year by four tenths of a percent, and that money was specifically uh, directed to the Connectivity Initiative, which is a broadband grant program. So this structure has been in place, um, <coughs> the State Universal Service Fund has been in place, I think, since 1994. Um, the programs have changed a little bit over the years. but. In terms of the revenue in the fund, because it's a proportional charge on your phone bill, um, those, uh, that revenue has been declining over the years, in part because, for one, um, people uh, you know, used to have a landline, and then they got a, a cell phone. Um, and they were paying the charge on both, both of those services. A lot of people now are dropping the landline, right? So that's no, there's a, a declining base. Um, also, with the bundling of services, um, VoIP with uh, broadband, cable, television, um, uh, the fees are going down on the, on the voice um, part of the phone bill. So to address the declining revenue in other states, one proposal is to switch to, rather than a proportion of potentially declining revenue, a flat fee that remains stable, and that fee is imposed on uh, the connection, your, your phone line, right? So you pay maybe a dollar a month, and it doesn't go up, it doesn't fluctuate with revenue. And so um, that's one methodology for funding universal service programs. So I think you heard maybe earlier 
um, in terms of financing pay access television specifically, you know, maybe making that another program that's funded through the Universal Service Fund, but then you also heard those revenues are going down, the state's having a hard time funding the existing programs. So I think the issue came up, well, do we just overall change the contribution method to a per line charge? Does that stabilize the fund? Potentially allow for um, expanding the distributions to other services. So these are all policy choices. Um, so that's basically a description. In other states, I think there are four states that have done some version of a per line charge. Um, Nebraska may have been the first state. Uh, the Nebraska Public Utilities Commission has a broader, somewhat broader authority than the Vermont um, Commission in the sense that they can on its own motion come up with different funding mechanisms for the Universal Service Program. So they initiated a proceeding in 2014 on their own motion um, and then I think three years later came up with a methodology that uses the, a hybrid, basically a connection fee on residential lines, small business lines, and still has a proportional fee on the larger businesses, and all of that's being monitored and is subject what to change. State was that? that was Nebraska. So other states that have looked at the connection, per connection fee, include Utah, New Mexico, and Maine. So I can't tell you in Vermont exactly how many lines of service there are, what the line count is, or what the possible, you know, what, if, what the fee might be um, to, you know, raise revenue sufficient to fund the existing programs or uh, the existing plus additional programs. Um, but that is certainly something that you could consider. So when you talk about a connection, are you talking uh, a people are dropping their landlines. Right. You're assuming they still have a connection because they might have it, uh, cable or fiber or whatever. They might have VoIP, you or know, VoIP, through yeah. a, through cable service, voice over internet, <coughs> um, or they might have a, just a cell phone and not have their landline anymore. They have sufficient cell service, so they just use a cell phone. Mm -hmm. So those voice services would be subject, would be considered a connection. Um, and then some households have many connections. Family members might have several cell phones or... Mm -hmm. Right now it's just on landlines. No. No? Mm -hmm. Okay. No. Nope. Right now it's on cell, cell phones. Too. Cell phones okay. and, and VoIP if it's interconnected with public switching. Is there anything that would stop, could stop the state from applying it to broadband? I think there's a preemption issue on broadband. So we're ta right now we're just talking about voice services. Right, but I'm, well now I'm talking about broadband services. So is there, so, but <coughs> connection charge on a broadband service may not be printed, or is it printed? So, <coughs> and we're under, make the pool bigger. Right, expanding the base. Right. I think you run into the same problem that you would as applying the universal surcharge on broadband. What if it applies to all carriers? Uh, I, so, it's, you know, you're raising probably one of the most problematic areas being faced in, by states in the telecommunications industry. Yeah. And when the FCC in 2016 reclassified broadband internet access as an information service, mm -hmm. it um, also uh, specified that to promote uh, broadband deployment, states were preempted from regulating or imposing taxes on broadband. So uh, I don't see that, and that, that's the problem. If you're, if all of your services are migrating to broadband and you're losing your revenue base, clearly, I think that's something that states are grappling with. Um, but the preemption is a big issue, and I'm not sure. I think you're how you get around that. So, did I understand you to say more <coughs> that uh, the USF currently applies to landlines, cell phones, and VoIP? And VoIP, and VoIP is Voice Over Internet Protocol, so that yep. applies broadband. 
It's used on a, an internet platform, yes, but it's a voice service and it interconnects with the public switch network. You can have a... So is that like an exception to this, you can't tax the internet thing? I, I don't know that it's an exception. The FCC has never classified VoIP service as either an information service or a telecommunication service and has allowed states to continue imposing the, the uh, Clay, cor correct me if I'm wrong, I think. No, I, th I think that's correct. I mean, the, the way to think about it is the service being provided. So yes, it's over a broadband connection, but it's it's a voice service. Okay. So um, in the case of Comcast, it's um, it's it's not simply an over the top service as it's just you know treated like every other internet traffic. Um, it's it's. It's a specific and separate um, service. It is interconnected with the uh, PSTN, and uh, those providers do pay into the fund and um, and have yeah. been and make up a large portion of the fund. Okay. So, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, the the programs that are funded by the USF. Um, are those mostly health and safety related um, programs, or you know, do they have a, a different public benefit that would be more comparable to the um, service provided by the access networks? I'd say public benefit. We can go over each of them. Um, so there's the relay service, which is for hearing impaired. So that's more of a health to support it, their communication. To ensure that yeah. folks who can't use um, a regular telephone are able to right. uh, participate uh, in society uh, and use the yeah. um, uh, communication services. So really service, uh, you know, we hire Sprint. Um, it's, um, allows a, um, a deaf person to interact with a Sprint call center who can then use by sign language relay um, information to the caller and, and back. So that's that's what that's for. Um, lifeline service. So there's a federal lifeline program that's a credit on uh, your telephone bill for low income uh, consumers of telephone service. We have um, an additional credit. So the the federal credit. Uh, reduces the um, the cost of telephone. Our state credit reduces that cost even further. Uh, so our, that's a four dollar and twenty five cent credit, in addition to the nine dollar and twenty five credit offered by the federal government. Um, and then nine one one makes up about eighty three percent of the fund. Okay. That's a clear public safety function. Um, and then the last is. Uh, Broadband internet, so the connectivity fund, which is um, uh, building, uh, spending money to build broadband facilities to locations that don't have it today. That helps. So, so really, the people that are benefiting are low income, hearing impaired, and then also the E911, which is a public benefit for everyone. Um, yeah. Okay. The fund, the fund is about, I'm sorry. I was going to say, but we don't want to lose sight of the fact that we're also trying to build out broadband with it, too. Yeah. Right, and that's that's a smaller, that's a pretty small portion. And yeah, why are so we, why is, why was the funding allocated for that? For broadband? Yeah, yeah, like, was, well, not why necessarily, I understand why, <laughs> but, um, but how was the... Uh, the the original structure was that, um, so there's an order of priority, that's an important oh, aspect okay. of of the the way the universal service fund is structured first comes relay service so we're paying for that first got it followed by lifeline um, then followed by 911 and last is the connectivity fund so the connectivity fund has traditionally been a kind of a sweep of kind of whatever's left over yeah um, and so that's fluctuated greatly but I would say that it's you know in, in recent years it, it um, has been between two hundred and five hundred thousand dollars, so it's not a, a big draw on the fund. Um, this past year, 
they the legislature increased the universal service fund from two percent to two point four percent and segregated that point four percent for broadband. So point four percent of the fund is guaranteed for broadband. All the other programs draw on the remaining two percent, uh, and um, that order of priority governs. And how much is that fund? Um, the FY19 uh, it's looking like about five and a half million. So is there any um, prohibition on, I mean the Broadband Internet Connectivity Fund comes from phone users. That's correct. So I guess once again I would ask, what stands in the way of a, a, a connection charge being accrued to other users of the network, meaning broadband, well, that's not, I'm not saying it properly, but broadband users. So why wouldn't broadband users be contributing to the broadband connectivity fund? Because federal law preempts states from levying taxes of any kind. And I, I believe Peter Blum spoke to this. Oh, he did, and he suggested connection charges, which is why I keep going back to it. Well, I, I mean, I think it's a matter of, I, I think his point is that, as you see, revenues, the amount of money that people spend on retail telecommunication services decline, the, the USF fee is pegged as a percentage of that revenue. <coughs> so if your bill for voice service is $100, you pay $2 in the fee. And as we've seen, the price for uh, voice service d decline over the years, we see that the, the amount that a subscriber contributes to the fund changes. My understanding is that a connection charge is a flat fee based on the line in service, uh, not, um, sorry, I keep thinking Ethan Allen is raising I his know, hand. I know, I just So regardless of the fluctuation in price for voice service, the fee would be, uh, uh, stagnant or, or static and be set to whatever uh, whatever I guess whatever the legislature sets it at or whatever the the uh, uh, revenue requirement for the funds programs is um, so in a way it's kind of regressive I mean no matter um, how much you're spending on telecommunication service that fee is the same okay but here's what Peter Blum said Connection charges. This option focuses on the wires and fibers that deliver end user service rather than the services themselves. It is widely understood as unlikely to provoke FCC preemption. This is the substance of my question. Although I think the FCC is endlessly clever in finding ways to expand its own jurisdiction, I accept that connection charges stand a good chance of surviving a preemption effort. So I would like to know more about that. The method is to stop looking at revenue from telecommunication services and focus instead on the wires and other facilities used to provide that broadband service. In most cases, there is a monthly or yearly charge for connection. A connection would be a telephone line or a broadband line. You might decide that a line that provides both is one or two unit connections. So he goes on to say, so I'm really interested in this sentence. I, I, I but I think there needs to be some consideration in that sentence also that the connection could very well be also the television connection, which is the cable service connection. And the cable service portion of that has a cap on it at 5% of gross revenues, which is the fee associated with it for using the public right of way. And if you're at the 5% cap for that connection uh, for the uh, cable services, you are at the cap of that fee. Right, but let's say you put sure. that franchise fee aside. So let's say you have the 5% cap, and you say, we're not going to recover that through a franchise fee. We're going to recover it through a connection charge that we can accrue on cable and broadband and telephony. I think ultimately you would be, uh, I, I, 
My opinion on that would be that you would be circumventing the intent of the Federal Cable Act, which put the cap of 5% on there, if you were to do it as you outlined. So what you're saying is that the uh, cable companies, if they're already at that 5% cap, would be exempted from a connection fee, any further connection fees? Well, I think we're, we're, we're yeah, I, I think that's correct, but I want to be careful that I think what we're doing is we're just uh, intermingling language. And ultimately, it is a fee or a tax associated with the use of the public right of way. And there is the uh, limitation on that from the cable service perspective that limits that at a 5% cap. So my answer is yes, but I had to explain it. Yeah. Right, but if you could accrue it on broadband connections, I guess that's where I'm going. I mean, this language suggests that you could research, we could research this further to find out the implications of connection charges also apply to broadband. Yeah, respectfully, that, that's the only place I'm hearing that. I'm, I'm not hearing that anywhere else in any of the presentations we've had before the panel. So I was hoping you would bring some research that spoke to this a little bit more specifically. I'm not sure exactly what he's saying there. Um, in the context, I think that I've looked at, the connection charge has been for a voice service. Now that might be delivered over broadband. Mm -hmm. That doesn't address the problem that was just raised if you're paying, because ultimately it's the customer that's paying. Mm -hmm. They're paying 5% on their broadband connection, which happens to come over a coaxial cable line. Mm -hmm. You know, would they then also be subject to a dollar or something per month surcharge to pay for universal service programs? And that's a legal question. I don't know that I can answer that. But I think Peter was talking about, a, you know, only a connection charge on wires and fiber. And I don't understand that because does that mean the wireless providers would not be paying? So I'm not sure exactly what he's getting at there, and I would need to speak with him. Mm -hmm. okay. Maria, thank you. Um, you mentioned four other states, uh, Nebraska, New Mexico, Utah, and Maine. Do you know if any of those four states are uh, levying the fee on broadband connections? Specific, oh, just to broadband. Or to anything to other voice. than voice, yeah. Other than voice, I, I don't know. Let me, I will look further okay. into exactly, you know, what the states are doing. But my understanding was it was on a voice service. So if you offered voice over it, you might be, with the understanding that there may be offsetting issues. Um, I just okay. haven't looked at it that much. And, yeah, I think there are challenges and concerns that are being raised in this context for these new, this new methodology um, you know, in the last couple of years that we've really seen it take hold. And so I would expect there are going to be concerns raised. So the key to uh, doing something like this would be in uh, trying to thread the needle in terms of the federal requirements and uh, what we're trying to accomplish. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think uh, Doug? Yes. Pick up the state. Let's see, the telephone personal property tax. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Um, for the record, I guess I'd. Yeah, the light's on. Uh, Doug Farnham, policy director and economist for the Vermont Department of Taxes. Um, I don't have a lot in the way of prepared remarks. I was um, just generally thought you wanted to hear about the telephone personal property tax. Mm -hmm. um, First of all, is there one? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So um, basically, the telephone personal property tax, and I would also talk about the telephone gross receipts tax at the same time. There's a in the corporation taxes section of Title 32, sets up the personal property tax, and that is where most of the revenue comes from. And then there's an alternative tax set up for smaller, 
telephone companies that, um, in fact, so few taxpayers pay it, I won't be able to disclose the exact amounts or number of filers because it's less than 10 filers. Uh, that's about all the detail that I can give you on that. Um, and that when you look at the amount of revenue coming in from the telephone personal property tax, the gross receipts tax doesn't really move the needle. Uh, it's, it's very little revenue. Um, but the gross receipts tax, that alternative tax structure, makes those companies exempt from the personal property tax, so it's, it's instead of, and it also makes them exempt from the corporate income tax. Um, the personal property tax, on the other hand, that uh, is paid in addition to corporate income tax. So those companies are still going to be filing corporate income tax returns, uh, but it is instead of uh, education property taxes. So um, it, without that section of law, those the real property at least, not personal property, uh, would be um, subject to the non-residential or non-homestead as of next year um, education tax rate. Uh, I personally was not even aware that there was a telephone personal property tax or telephone gross receipts tax. So um, <clears throat> what is that actually assessed on? So when, it's when we talk about a te right. telephone as a personal property, I mean, I'm thinking of a handset or something like that. Uh, what right. Um, so the first gate that it has to pass through is that in order for this tax to be levied, it has to be a business that's uh, in the first tier of providing telephone <coughs> services, which is basically defined as traditional landline telephone services. So it has to be in that type of business. Um, if it's uh, reselling telephone services, then then it doesn't qualify for the definition. So it's kind of a an older definition that um, has the audience for it has been shrinking over time. Mm -hmm. um, so the second gate, then what is the tax imposed upon? It's on real and personal property, so business personal property, meaning um, the infrastructure, the, the lines themselves, the, um, unless they are you know, leasing space from a utility company that's, that's going to be treated separately. So any of their infrastructure in the state um, and the, uh, if they have uh, machinery or other equipment in state, it would be levied on that as well. And then it's imposed at a rate of, um, I may get the rate slightly wrong, I think I'm right, but I think it's 2.37% of net book value. I know it's based on net book value and I believe it's 2.37%. Um, so that net book value is also um, that is a, a rabbit hole unto itself of how to, how to calculate that. But essentially it's supposed to represent the, the operational value of, of the infrastructure. Okay, so, so that's, on, <coughs> that's on all the personal property a telephone company owns? Yes. Okay. And is, do other telcos, well not telcos, do other cable companies pay? some version of this? So it's my understanding, um, and this understanding may not be perfect, uh, but cable companies are separately defined um, for federal purposes, and this kind of interplays with this, that they're not, cable companies aren't necessarily defined as telephone companies. So in order to qualify for this tax, they have to be primarily engaged in the business of providing telephone services and the vast majority of cable companies are not going to qualify for that definition. Um, but do they pay property, I mean, is the property tax, in, is there an equivalent? So there's, for a cable company? Yeah. There are multiple equivalents, yes. Um, sorry. No. <laughs> the, <laughs> sorry. So getting into uh, the treatment of, in general, broad terms of a cable company, um, they have no exemption from corporate income taxes, meaning they would be subjected to corporate income taxes. Um, la this legislative session, uh, there was a change made in Vermont corporate income tax treatment that went from cost of performance for services, um, and I'll try to keep this brief and high level. Basically, we allowed service companies to source where they, where they the, the cost of performing that service 
was held. So in many cable companies' cases, they would source that to their headquarters because that's where most of their staff are, and they're providing remote services. This year, we changed in corporate income uh, from cost of performance to market-based sourcing, which means we allocate that service income for apportioning their corporate income tax liability to the place where the service is performed. And it's impactful for many industries. It's a general, a very broad uh, change in our corporate income tax treatment. It is quite impactful for uh, service industries like cable companies because uh, where previously those services may have been apportioned out of state, if, if their headquarters were out of state or if most of their service personnel were out of state, now it's based on their customers and we expect them to apportion the income from those services uh, to Vermont. So corporate income does apply to cable companies and uh, is likely to increase on that industry under market-based uh, sourcing. Um, also, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, and the revenue from that is expected. Is it where does that? <coughs> That's um, general fund um, general. because of the 2017 federal tax changes that. Revenue source has been highly volatile um, in an upward direction, um, but it's a little bit over a hundred million, um, and it generally fluctuates historically between sixty and ninety million, in in, in all going to the general fund. The corporate income. Corporate income tax, yes. Um, and the, and the changes. The changes from cost of performance to market based sourcing aren't expected to dramatically increase oh, okay. corporate income tax. However, they, they do change who will be paying it, and it's a move to be more consistent with other states. Most states have been moving in the direction of market-based sourcing because it's seen as a more fair, more modern way to, to treat companies. Um, because if someone is, think about a Vermont company, if they're providing services out of state, we are taxing on them, them on that, and then they may be getting taxed in those other states for providing the services as well. So under our previous model, there was a potential for double taxation of Vermont-based uh, corporations. So are there equivalents to the telephone personal property tax on the cable side beyond corporate income tax? So their, their property would be subjected to the um, just regular ed education property taxes. They have no exemption or special treatment there. Um, so. Uh, the primary thing that the personal property tax takes the place of is the education property tax. So the way it would work functionally right now is if you were to just, if you were to say just repeal the telephone personal property tax, just take that subchapter out of Vermont law, then that, though they would revert to um, non-homestead education property tax. And that's, you know, approximately one, a dollar fifty-nine on the fair market value which has some correlation to net book value, but I could not um, explain that in less than a day, probably. Um. And it's <coughs> I, I just have a, yeah, I'm sorry, did you want to, okay. Um, just a really basic question. Um, I'm certainly, when you start talking about taxes, I get lost easily. Um, the, uh, the, the telephone personal property tax, the revenue generated from that, does that go into the education fund? No. Okay. So that goes to the general fund. Okay. Um, and in the money that um, is is raised uh, through uh, assessments on cable companies for their property, does that go into the general fund as well? No, that would just go into the education. That goes into the education fund. Okay. Yeah. Thank, I, you. thank you. I believe it's just because the the telephone personal property and there we also have a sorry. For, I don't want to deviate too much, but railroad company tax. We have a couple of kind of older taxes that are on these uh, an industry basis like this, where they go into the general fund, but they pre-existed uh, Act 60, and I just don't know that they became part of any conversations. Could I ask another? The question you just asked um, about the cable company assessments, there, that's property. You're talking about property tax there too, right? Just property. Um, Education tax doesn't apply to personal property, um, but looking at how how town <coughs> some towns can still tax personal property, they have the they have the authorization to if they choose to. Not many choose to do it. 
Um, but most of the value in the telephone personal property tax is it. I wouldn't label it as personal property because it's real and personal, and most of the value comes from the real components, okay. um, installed infrastructure. And that goes into the general fund and the, the telephone gross receipts tax. This is also general fund. It's also general fund. Okay. And oh. I'm sorry, just to clarify that you said the gross receipts tax. Telephone gross receipts tax. It's an alternative to the personal personal property tax. Okay. Sorry, I was thinking of another gross receipts tax. Yeah, yeah, it's I got confused. It's very confusing. Yeah. Um, so are all telcos subject to the telephone personal property tax? Uh, what's the? How is that defined? Is it your telco? You're regulated that way, or your cable company and you have VoIP lines? What? How does that work? So the definitions are older and they're not necessarily cross-referenced with how we regulate. Um, companies, so I couldn't, I could not point in the statute to a direct relationship between how we regulate the telephone Maybe. company and how we tax it. It's got a kind of a standalone uh, definition. Maybe you could specify who pays the telephone personal property tax, which companies. I definitely can't do that. Can you um, let us know? Could you let us know? I can okay. tell you that there are. It's paid by um, uh, between ten and twenty companies pay the telephone um, personal property tax and the revenue from it uh, in fiscal year 2012 was about nine million and then it has steadily declined um, on, on pretty much an even slope up to this point where in fiscal year 19 it was just over five million um, so we've seen about on an average three to four hundred thousand of revenue loss in this in this tax type per year um, but our our <coughs> tax confidentiality laws prevent me from disclosing any direct taxpayer information um, so I can't tell you who pays it sorry okay. Thank you, Don. All right. any other questions I find it very confusing myself <laughs> I just um, want to make a, a comment that telephone and cable companies also pay the gross receipts tax, which is um, a tax to the Department of Public Service and the Public Utility Commission that is in addition to these other taxes, and that's uh, usually levied on gross revenue, um, I believe about 0.5% of gross revenue for the state right. for both telephone and, and cable. Well, we saw in that memo last week, last month, how many, <coughs> it's actually kind of incredible how many taxes are on telecommunications providers. I mean, yep. there's every flavor for cable companies. Yeah. Okay, yeah. well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, I guess the next thing on the agenda would be the sales tax on pre written software access to remote that's otherwise known as Falcox. <laughs> uh, the, I guess uh, Graham Campbell. Is he I don't see Graham in the room. Check this office. Is that in the building? Yeah. Um, it's actually on the agenda for 11:45, and we're kind of running about uh, 25 minutes early. Yeah, he's speaking on the next three, right? So he, yeah, he's on the, for the next three. So, <coughs> um, possibly a break. We can have a break. Okay. Thank so you. Let's, uh, let's be back here and say uh, 11:30. Ready and uh, oh, get put this on the record here. How are you? Very well. Thank you. Okay, we are on the record again. <coughs> So we have uh, Graham Campbell. How are you? I'm doing very well. How are you? You're welcome. Um, so uh, we got three items here that, that uh, we'll talk about. I guess uh, sales tax on pre-written software, taxes on video streaming services, and satellite TV tax. And I guess we'll take them right in a row because you're going to speak to all of them, right? Apparently, yeah. Okay. Um, so I don't know. I have paper copies. And I don't know. Yeah, Mike and Mike. Yep. I don't know what you're doing. Okay. Yeah, we're doing. 
You guys got it. Yep. Okay, so um, my name is Graham Campbell. I work at the Vermont Legislative Joint Fiscal Office. Um, in our office, I handle mostly um, non property, non transportation revenue sources. So the big ones income taxes, uh, personal and corporate, sales and use taxes, and then a slew of all other uh, types of taxes. So um, I was asked to come here and speak about um, taxes on pre written software. Um, both accessed remotely and not accessed remotely, and I'll go into what those that means, essentially. And then um, Dan Dickerson helped put together some materials on satellite taxes. Um, I'm not I'm super familiar with that um, area of taxation, but I'm going to sort of kind of sum up what Dan said, and if there are any questions, then I can forward them to Dan Dickerson after the meeting. So when we talk about uh, pre-written software, tax on pre-written software, um, that's what has been referred to as a cloud tax, right? Or is that different than um, So the cloud tax, as it's been colloquially called, is the sales tax mm -hmm. on pre-written software accessed remotely. So pre-written software is broken down into two areas. Pre-written software that's downloaded or not accessed remotely, and then pre-written software accessed remotely. Pre-written software accessed remotely is what you consider the cloud. Um, the other pre-written software would be sort of um, like audiobooks, streaming, things like that. So I'll get into that as I go along here. Um, but correct, but when you hear things like Netflix tax or cloud tax, just remember that 95% of the time, even in the sort of discourse of tax discussion, we're not talking about a specific tax on cloud um, pre-written software access remotely or Netflix or Hulu or anything. We're talking about the sales and use tax being applied to those um, services and products. So a quick overview of the sales tax. The rate in Vermont is 6% on the final sale of what we just call tangible personal property. Um, in sort of layman's terms, what that means is things that you can touch or things that you can, can see. Um, largely that means goods. In Vermont we don't really tax any services. There's I think about 35 services that we tax, but the idea of services is usually not taxed in most state tax jurisdictions that have a sales tax. Um, some localities in Vermont have a 1% local options tax, and usually it's collected at the point of sale, so or at the final point of sale. Usually the consumer it's collected there and it's remitted to the Department of Taxes by the retailer, whoever sells it. Um, and the big thing that's been happening in sales and use taxes is we can now, because of the Supreme Court decision in 2018 um, against Wayfair um, versus South Dakota, we can now collect um, sales taxes on sales from remote sellers, so online sales. Um, there's no longer the requirement that the remote seller have an actual physical presence in the state for us to collect sales tax. Um, a key point that I'm going to emphasize here is that sales taxes, 100% of that revenue right now is dedicated to the education fund. So any sort of proposal to use sales tax money would need to be diverted out of the education fund, um, specifically written into any sort of statute. Um, and to give you a sense of how much we collect, we are projected to collect about $436 million in fiscal 20. That is... Um, I think probably the third or fourth largest revenue stream in the state. So this gets to your uh, question, uh, Representative, on pre-written software. So I'm going to kind of combine my presentation here for cloud taxes and streaming taxes. And I should call them the sales taxes on those two things. I'm into one presentation, and then I'll talk about the satellite tax on the back end. So when we talk about pre-written software, um, things like digital services, uh, audio and video streaming services, downloads, cloud, I shouldn't have put services, but cloud software um, is considered in this giant bucket of pre-written software. Um, and in Vermont, we currently consider 
um, certain types of pre-written software to be tangible personal property. So something that is considered tangible personal property is taxable for the sales tax, and therefore we currently collect the sales tax on that. So um, generally, if you think about software that's downloaded from the internet and installed on a computer, that's like the key thing, installed on a computer. If you're downloading it, you're purchasing it, it's installed on a computer. Or if you're buying a disk from you know, Office Depot and installing a computer, that is currently considered tangible personal property and is taxable. The same goes for any software delivered, like I said, on a portable disk or a USB. And things like audio visual works, audio works, audio visual being you know, streaming services, audio works, um, which are like audio books, digital books, and ringtones are currently considered tangible personal property. So things like Netflix, Hulu, and other streaming services, cur streaming services currently pay the sales and use tax in Vermont. Hmm. So, so how, how is that charged? If I uh, go out to Netflix and I download a, um, a movie. It's on uh, your subscription. It's like on your subscription. Oh, it's part of your subscription. Thing. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not sure how much revenue we currently collect from all those types of services uh, at the moment. That would be interesting to know. Yeah, I'm, I'll have to check in with the tax department. My understanding is that it's um, not an insignificant amount of money, but it might, the, my ability to get that information might be limited by confidentiality <coughs> from the tax department. So uh, just a question on that. Mm -hmm. So if I subscribe to Netflix, mm -hmm. um, does Netflix have to report uh, who, um, how many subscribers it has in Vermont, and then they remit a portion of the subscription fees? Uh, mm. uh, tax I would guess not. My intuition would be that I'm uh, just thinking about how the form, how you report your sales tax as a business, you essentially report your taxable sales. So Netflix would report how much in taxable sales they would have in Vermont. So that would include. You know, for the the quarter or month, I can't remember how <coughs> how it's remitted, but they were remit in that month or quarter how much in taxable sales they have. So you would, from the tax part, would not know. I don't believe how many subscri uh, subscribers um, Netflix would have based upon their information. What they would know is how much in um, taxable sales they would each have. So that, but that, that would be a pass through to the customer, right? A line item, just like sales tax would be. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're not. I don't believe they're required to put on the on the bill, on the bill that it's a sales tax. But um, in theory, it's passed. <laughs> <through. laughs> Anything else? Sorry, I should talk up from the side. But... <laughs> I'm gonna be looking at some of these. <laughs> Less neck turning. So you're uh, nodding and everything. What were you? <laughs> yes, uh, you Mr. Were, Campbell is correct. Uh, we do not know the number of transactions. Uh, we don't include that because it's not part of the tax and it would be burdensome. Um, we, as long as we had more than ten streaming companies, then we could share information. But if it's less than ten, we can't share uh, direct information. And then, um, I'm sorry, what was the last? Thing? The line item. Was it there? Uh, they are required to separately state it. So if, if you look at your Netflix bill, they do uh, break out the 6% sales tax. Okay. Yes. Um, just out of curiosity, the confidentiality uh, agreements, as far as, you know, if there's less than 10, you can't talk about it. You can't uh, say who they are. Um, is that something that's, um, that's an agreement between a state and those companies, or is that uh, just a general rule of law? Something. That's an excellent question. So in, in Vermont law, it says that the department is not allowed to disclose any return information. Um, and there are plenty of exemptions from that, but they're specific to, for certain situations and for certain tax types. Um, for instance, property transfer tax returns are public. Mm -hmm. So we can talk about any field of data on a property transfer. Um, but everything else is protected by confidentiality. And it says we can't disclose any return information. The IRS has um, best practices of not disclosing aggregated information for populations of 10 or less. Because when you get to under 10, you can kind of, you can figure out roughly what their tax is and what their income is if you need a tax <coughs> type. So 
that rule of 10 isn't in, in a rule or law. It's a policy at the department, a policy that we get from the IRS. Um, and we do make exceptions sometimes and produce more of a range or an approximation if it's less than 10, but it's a really important question. Um, but it's, it's on an exception basis and we really have to consider if we are undermining the taxpayer's rights and if, if I disclose information, I can actually be fined uh, significantly and go to jail. So. And does that non-disclosure um, apply to identifying the companies, or does it uh, pertain also to the amount of monies? So in most cases, it prevents us from identifying the company, like in telephone personal property tax. But with sales tax, because it's a pass-through, there's a provision in Vermont law where we, the department can confirm whether or not a company is registered for sales tax and if they're in good standing. So we can't tell you how much sales tax they're remitting, but we can tell you if they are remitting and if they're in good standing. So if they have an account and they're in good standing, it means that they're paying the sales tax and that we haven't uh, run into any issues with them. Well, thank you for that. Okay. Thank you, Doug. And so the key point I want you to take away from this is that currently we, we apply the sales and use tax to digital streaming services. That would include Netflix, Amazon Prime, Hulu. Um, so for streaming services, what do other states do? So 45 states have a sales tax and 33 apply their sales tax to streaming services, of which this includes Vermont. And states have um, gradually started expanding their sales tax bases to include these types of services, and so three that have recently done this are Washington, which relies entirely, mostly for its um, revenues on sales taxes, Iowa and Pennsylvania. So the switching gears, the concept of a separate tax on video st streaming service or audiovisual st streaming services is not something that I have generally seen happening um, nationwide. There are a couple of jurisdictions. The main one I saw researching this in, in the past and for this is Florida's communication services tax. Um, this is a tax that has existed in Florida well before the advent um, of um, video and music streaming services. But it applies to cable and satellite television services, telephone services, mobile services, and they recently put in video and music streaming. It has a varying rate, but it's 7.44%, um, broken out into two parts. One is this 5.07 for the state tax, which the customer pays, and 2.37, which is a gross receipts tax, which is paid by the dealer. In this case, usually it's uh, you know Netflix or Hulu or the utility. But things like internet services are exempt, and residential sales only pay that second rate. Um, that's sort of one that I've seen in states. I've seen the city of Chicago recently expanded their amusement tax, which is, I think, 9%, to include um, Netflix and other streaming services. Um, there was a protracted legal battle over whether these things qualified as amusements. But generally, <coughs> we talk about taxes on streaming services. We're mostly talking the sales tax, and very few actual jurisdictions have created a separate thing on top of their um, sales tax for these types of services. Can, can we put an asterisk on the Florida communication service tax to talk about <clears throat> after you're done? Sure. So I'm curious about this. It's applied to all carriers, you said. Yeah, it's applied to the, well, there's two, there's the rate of 7.44 and it's split out. So the five is paid by the customer rate right on their bill. And then the 2.37 is remitted and is paid for by the actual dealer or the, the company itself. Is that called an excise tax? Is that? They call it a gross receipts tax. Okay. I mean, all right, sorry. Do you know how the 5%, uh, where the 5% comes from? Uh, is that the federal franchise fee associated with cable service? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, and then I guess another question is, does it get to 5.07 by taking into account the fee on fee perspective that is traditionally known associated with uh, cable services? Which would be my presumption, but I would like confirmation on that. So the question is that 5.07 related to the federal? Um, uh, federal franchise fee. 
and does it rise, which is capped at 5%, and does it rise to 5.07 based on the fee-on-fee -fee issues? Okay. Do you think a related question, you may know this, does Florida charge the 5% the franchise fee, the cable? I think that's it. I would um, think this yeah. would be it, but mm -hmm. that would be a question. Does, yeah. does Florida which, subsume it in the franchise fee into the... It, would be likely, it looks that way yeah. based on the number, but I, I guess that's the question. I don't have a, a certain answer to that question. We could find out. Okay. I'll look into it and get back to the committee. Thank you. Thank you. So that basically <coughs> covers what I'm going to talk about regarding streaming services. And so what we're talking about there is pre-written software, but per, the next category is this idea of pre-written software accessed <laughs> remotely. And this is what we commonly know as cloud, um, cloud-based services and products, cloud software. So cloud services are what we call pre-written software accessed remotely. Um, and this is solely, this is software that's solely accessed through the internet or a cloud-based platform. And I should pause and say there are many iterations of what this could possibly mean and different stakes take different definitions. But under the current Vermont statutes, um, pre-written software accessed remotely is not considered tangible personal property and is therefore not taxable. And so um, sometimes you'll hear um, cloud services and cloud software being referred to as software as a service. Um, generally that's um, what cloud services and cloud um, taxes or cloud, taxes, cloud software is being referred to. But you might also hear things um, such as infrastructure as a service. Um, this is a different type of cloud-based service um, where um, a company is operating com com computer infrastructure where the customer would pay the contractor to operate on the customer's behalf. So a good example of this is, is servers. The company is operating server space on behalf of a customer. That is infrastructure as a service. And there's a separate um, category called platform as a service where company will provide software services to a customer that allows a customer to develop and run and make changes to um, that software. So a good example of that would be um, web design services. So some states have, when they've decided to make changes to whether they sh should tax pre-written software access remotely, have narrowed the definitions to things like software as a service. Others have um, roped in all three of these types of um, services and software. So, um, when I'm talking about pre-written software access from early, I'm largely referring to software as a service. Um, and because this is what was talked about last year during the legislative session. So 18 other states um, currently consider pre-written ac software access from early in the narrower definition of software as a service as taxable. So they're applying their sales tax to that um, type of software. So if, if you had a um, company that sells point of sale software uh, to a retail outlet, mm -hmm. what would that fall under? Would that be part of the infrastructure as a service or platform as a service or a software as a service? It kind of depends on how it's being used, but my guess is that if you think about that software, that if that company's um, I was talking to Doug earlier. If you think of that software as what we call canned, or it's it's designed and it's sold as like a package to the um, to the uh, retailer that's using it, and that would be considered pre-written software access remotely, more on the side of uh, software as a service. And then that, if the exemption were removed, would be taxable under um, under a change. And remember, this is the sales tax we're talking about. We're not talking about yeah. a separate tax. Okay, that's kind of a side anyway. So. so I have an, an example here that might help clarify things. Um, but just to give an, uh, an update to the committee of what was talked about this past session, S96, which was um, the clean water bill, was amended by the House, and it repealed the exemption that currently exists in the statute for pre-written software access remotely. Um, that portion was removed from the bill um, from a Senate further proposal amendment. Um, and eventually that bill um, was enacted into law without um, 
that clause in the in the bill. We estimated that for fiscal 20, it would generate about $6 million in sales tax revenue. With the caveat, this will grow, likely grow quite quickly since this is a very rapidly um, changing and growing industry in software. So I'll give a basic example of what pre-written software access remotely is. So the, the classic example that we use is, is TurboTax. So if you want to do your taxes using TurboTax, you can do it in three ways. The first is you can go to the store and you can buy a TurboTax disk and install it on your computer. The second way is you can go to TurboTax's website, pay them, and download TurboTax and put it on your computer. And the third is you can go to TurboTax.com, log in with your email and uh, password, and you can do your taxes right there in the, on the internet in the cloud. Right now, sales tax is applied to options one and two there, but it is not applied to option three because that, option three, is considered pre-written software accessed remotely. So it's the same software, it's what we call can, it's pre-written. Um, it's the same thing as the first two, but you're accessing it over the, the internet. And so that is currently not being taxed. So any of the exemption would mean taxing things like that. And why was it um, struck from the Senate bill? Because it wasn't germane to water, clean water, or because there were doubts about it? I think it was a policy decision by um, the Senate Finance Committee to remove it. <coughs> I mean, was there anything intrinsic to the idea of taxing PSAR that people, I mean, was there a big rise up in lobbying efforts against this, or? Um, so maybe if I just rewind a little bit. So what the House did was they, um, they in order to pay for clean water, they <coughs> Um, took a certain percentage of the meals and rooms tax, which currently goes into the education fund, out and dedicated it to clean water. But to replace the money that they had taken out, they ended this exemption for pre written software access remotely. So the education fund will be made whole. So that was their essentially construct of how to fund clean water. What ultimately came out of the Senate and was enacted was a, um, a, a redirection of meals and rooms tax money from the general fund to the clean water fund. Um, during the testimony, there was quite a bit of testimony against repealing the exemption in the Senate Finance Committee, um, and there was a large. There were, if I remember, there was a lot of confusion about what this might get applied to, and so I believe the Department of Tax has been working this summer, and they was directed to to educate taxpayers on what exactly this would apply to, and helpfully they created this a fact sheet which they have for lots of other sales and use tax items about pre-written software access remotely to help taxpayers understand <coughs> what it is we're talking about. And so this is a this is directly from that fact sheet to give ta to assist taxpayers what the current system is for, for taxing software and what falls under pre-written software access remotely. And is this not tax now because it's a modern kind of tax and we haven't, I mean, we just started thinking about it in the last couple of years? My understanding is that there's an exemption actually in statute right. for this. So usually that means, so there's there's taxes that aren't, we're not, we might not be collecting because it's, I don't know, what's a good, the marketplace. Um, bill that we passed this year. We weren't previously collecting on Amazon's third-party marketplaces, but that was because our statute was not updated enough to capture those types of skills, sales, so we changed the language. This one, pre-written software access remotely, is specifically written as exempt in our statute, so that would lead me to indicate that this is specifically put in as an exemption for some reason. There's no statutory purpose for it right now, which most of our sales tax exemptions have. Um, but I don't think this has, it's not like one of those modernization things. It's specifically written in. Do you remember why it was exempt? So, um, a couple minutes on the history of this one? Sure. sure. Um, so, in approximately uh, 2010, we adopted, we had adopted streamlined definitions to be in streamlined sales tax and then updated our rules and regulations and 
In about 2010, the Department of Taxes pointed out that our new definitions treat digital products as tangible personal property because that was an update that Streamlined Sales Tax did and that most states are now talking about software as tangible personal property. So that was in you know the early 2000s, that change happened in tax law. In, uh, then between 2011 and 2015, the Department of Taxes started to say, we are going to have to impose sales tax on um, uh, pre-written software that's accessed remotely because we consider that tangible personal property. And then in 2015, uh, right as we were about to finalize rules that clarified that this was taxable, uh, the legislature chose to pass a specific exemption to prevent that from occurring. Um, I believe a lot of the discussion was around the growing tech industry and promoting that, that uh, industry in Vermont, um, but I wasn't directly engaged in those conversations at the time. But that's my understanding of the history. Okay, so I'm going to move on to satellite TV taxes, and I'm, again, I'll caveat this by saying this is not my bailiwick, um, but I'm going to present what Dan gave to me, and if you have any questions, I can write them down and forward them to Dan. So, again, I'm still sticking in the sales tax world. Um, so, satellite <coughs> television services um, and products are s currently subject to the 6% sales and use tax rate, and this applies to both the programming plans themselves and any accessories that you know, go along with it. Um, we don't really know exactly what the current sales tax revenues from satellite TV providers are because um, there are not very many payers um, who actually pay this uh, or remit this sales tax. But we do know from prior information when there were more that um, they were remitting about $5.3 million, and that was in fiscal year 2012. So but I have no indication of whether that number has gone up or down. Um, you know, if people are cord cutting or getting rid of their um, their TV services, it might have gone down. But then again, these these companies have gotten bigger. You know, it could have gone up. So that just gives you sort of the ballpark of what we're talking about. And my understanding is that satellite TV uh, providers don't also provide internet services. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. They do. Some do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Spotty, but yeah. Um, Dan put together this list of what other states in New England do um, regarding satellite taxes. So Maine has a specific service provider tax of 6%, which is in lieu of their state sales tax. Um, New Hampshire doesn't have a state tax. Um, Apparently, satellite TV is exempt from their, their communication services tax, which I don't know a whole lot about, so I can't speak about that. Massachusetts has a separate 5% excise tax on satellite services, and it is um, in lieu of its sales tax. Um, Connecticut has its sales tax of 6.35%, and then a 5% gross earnings tax um, that the, uh, the company has to pay, but they're allowed to pass it on to the consumer with a line on their bill. Rhode Island applies their sales tax. New York doesn't have a state tax on um, satellite TV uh, providers, but they, there is um, a lot of potential for local taxes in New York, particularly New York City um, has very high sales taxes. And then Connecticut collects a gross earnings tax on the provider, um, but then that is like um, Connecticut. Oh, I had Connecticut on my flights. Dan had Connecticut. <laughs> I was like, that sounds awfully familiar to what I just said about the medicine. <laughs> yeah, can I just ask? Right? Yeah. Dan, do you know anything about the New Hampshire Communication Services Tax and what that is? I don't. That would be interesting. Along the lines of the Florida, right? I guess I'm, again, I'm wondering, you know, these are, these are accrued on communications companies, like who pays it, and why don't federal preemptions create a problem there? I'll look into it and get back to the committee. Yeah. Um, here are some examples of other states that apply specific um, taxes to satellite um, services. So Florida with its communication service tax, which I've spoken about. 
However, the rate is higher to what is called direct to home satellite um, services. So the, the tax is that um, 2.37 plus um, 9.0 so is a per total of 11.44 percent of the provider bills to customers. Kentucky apparently has a telecommunications tax on quote multi-channel video and audio service, a 3% excise tax, which is quite like a sales tax, and then a 2.4% gross receipts tax that the, um, that the dealer or the company collects but then is allowed to pass on to the consumer. Tennessee has a special sales tax rate that it applies to sell, uh, satellite television services. But this would not work in a place like Vermont because we are uh, constrained by the streamlined sales tax in use agreement, um, which prevents charging a higher sales tax to cert to a different good. And then Connecticut also collects a multi-channel video or audio services tax at 6.25 percent. This is Utah. Or Utah, sorry. So how are those? So these multi-channel video or audio service taxes. What, I mean, we don't charge. That's not something we have here. So I guess that falls in the category of New Hampshire and Florida. And what are those? Is that something that could be a broad based assessment and replace the franchise fee, but also be accrued on broadband? How does that work? And again, there may be people at the table that understand this, but. but I have curiosity about that. Nothing I'm seeing on this list is applied to broadband. Multi-channel video and audio services? No. Multi-channel video is a cable provider. Yeah, it's just another name for a cable provider. Audio service might be like Sirius, XM, radio, something like that. Okay. I'm going to ask Dan to look into this and get back to you. And then obviously the committee is aware of this, like the cable franchise fee and tax. Um, I guess it's called a fee. Um, it's currently applied to the cable television providers and it funds um, BG programming at 5% five, 5 tax rate. Um, and I've been informed that proposals in the past have talked about applying this to satellite TV providers. Um, and Mark Peralt in our office who worked on this in the past based upon data from the tax department in 2012 on gross receipts for satellite um, TV providers estimated that a 5% tax would bring in about 4.4 million. Although as a caveat here, that estimate could have changed significantly uh, depending upon whether the, gr the gross receipts of satellite TV providers has gone up and down, since, uh, four down since then. And again, that's not data that, so we, we relied on that estimate. We contacted the Department of Taxes to give us what, essentially what they were remitting in sales tax as a proxy for what their gross receipts were. And then we'd be able to back into what the revenue would be with a 5% franchise fee on, on top of that. However, because of um, uh, the number of taxpayers that have changed for satellite TV services, they're no longer able to replace <coughs> with, with the information on the gross receipts for satellite. TV providers. So right now the franchise fee is not applied to the satellite TVs, but you're saying that if, if it were applied to satellite TV, it would raise four to five million? There have been proposals in the past to apply that fee to satellite TV providers, and in the past, in 2012, it was estimated to bring in 4.4 4 million. And is that, a, is that allowable to be able to apply that to satellite TV? You know, I'm not 100% sure whether it's okay. allowable. The franchise fees are, re are a public benefit related to cable, Yeah. not satellite. So the FCC, I mean the Federal Act, allows for franchise fees. So it's kind of an apple and an orange from a federal regulatory standpoint. Right. So I don't think you actually, I think the state could say, oh, we want to tax satellite, which I think in the past it tried to. But it wouldn't be applying a franchise fee to okay. satellite. So it would be basically it'd taking be a sales tax or a tax that kind of the a, state kind decided of a to kind do. Of tax. Right. Right. Okay. Nice research, thank you. Yeah, I apologize. My knowledge of like the whole world of public access television and things like that and the rules around um, tax 
optimization FEC rules are not super strong. So I will get back to the community with answers to your questions you had earlier. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Okay, so that pretty much concludes our agenda. Um, I hope that we'll have uh, our other committee members here. Uh, so I guess the question meeting. I have is what is the um, purpose of, of the public hearing? Maybe? So, I mean, I think we it would be helpful for us to spend some time talking about what we've heard and what other information we might want. But then what are, what's the question that we would be posing? And is that question right for a public hearing? Have we, have we confirmed that, have we posted that date too? Because that date, I, I, I now have an out of town meeting that, on that date. Not an out of town meeting? On yeah, that day. I, I did not at the last meeting when we, when we responded to the survey, but I, <coughs> I'm not required to be at an out of state meeting. So, I, um, as committee assistant, I sent out a, a Microsoft Outlook meeting request for both of the public hearing and the regular committee meeting as soon as um, the chair had decided on what date it would be. And I've added them into the database so it reflects on the General Assembly's website that there is two PEG access TV meetings that day, one at 10 being the public mm -hmm. hearing and one at 1 o'clock being the regular committee meeting. What day was that again? October 16th, I think. Oh, 16th or 18th? I'll have to, uh, 16th. 16th is what we had, is what the chair had. <laughs> what is it saying on agenda here? Say 16th. 16th. Okay, October 16th. I think mm -hmm. I've got it on my calendar. Is that the day you're gone? I'm out of state. The 16th, 17th, and 18th. Okay. The legislation requires that meeting to be on the value of PEG access television to Vermont communities and the cost of such programming and services and funding options. So, can I send a representative? Um, I guess you could, yeah. Okay. Um, my thoughts about a public hearing would be some, that we would have some kind of a proposal ready for, um, for discussion of public hearing. Uh, I'm not sure that we're ready to do that yet, though. Um, so, I would want to consult with our chair. And see what we decide on as far as uh, what type of things that we're thinking about. Uh, our charge is to actually um, <clears throat> report back to the legislature in the form of proposed legislation. So uh, it presumes that we will have a recommendation that, that would uh, record <coughs> legislation. And, uh, I think as part of that, we'll have to contain uh, our recommendation as far as any additional type of funding we're, we're recommending. Um, and the thing to remember is that whatever we propose, whatever we, this, this committee recommends to the legislature, the proposed legislation is going to go through the committees of jurisdiction, the Energy and Technology Committee and the Finance Committee and the, and the House and the Finance Committee and the Senate. And probably also through Ways and Means in the House and uh, uh, appropriations. So um, whatever we recommend is not cast in stone anyway. It's going to be a proposal. And uh, those committees will have their own uh, hearings and take their own testimony, and then decide if, if they want to modify those proposals or not. So uh, maybe since we have a couple of minutes yet, um, are there any comments from the members of the committee in terms of what we might recommend as a form of uh, revenue? Can we go back to the date for a moment? Is there any sure. chance of moving that date? I, I, uh, I think we could. Okay. <laughs> I, I, can I suggest a date? Sure. Friday the 25th? Friday the 25th of October? <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, if we... Is that 
could possibly work. I've got a conflict with that in the evening, but uh, and that's down in Connecticut, so I have to go down. I can give you a ride. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, one, one thing, just logistically about this building, uh -huh. that's the last day before the building shuts down to go through two weeks of renovations. So that's, I imagine, there's going to be a lot of movement of equipment moving out of the building for our off-site location during that shutdown. They're, they're, they're cutting the power to, to the state house for a renovation project. Could we hold it to the pavilion? Right, so we, I, I recommend an alternative location. I mean, I think the building is still going to be open and functional, but that's the day before it all goes down, so you know it's going to be a mess. Yeah. Are there any other days besides the 25th? Uh, Do the 21st, Monday the 21st. Okay. That works for me. The building's got room 10 and 11 available, so okay. I don't think we want to be back in here. <laughs> okay. Anything um, that we just want? Look back at Karen, have a well, we will. We'll have. I would suggest uh, that we put out a uh, <coughs> meeting request you. <laughs> proposal <coughs> and see who can make it. A doodle poll for it. Like a doodle poll. Yeah. yeah. Do I'm sort of curious to hear from other members of the committee what you heard today and what you know if you see a viable path for what you in some of these examples and models that could be adapted the future of PEG and public benefit in general? Well, I, I, I have a suggestion. I think I brought it up at the last meeting. Uh, I think that everyone's put a lot of work into this. I think we've done some uh, good work on demonstrating, uh, I think Lauren Glenn, to take your words, that there isn't a uh, catastrophe in the next several years uh, with regard to AMO funding. So my suggestion would be that we don't be a solution in search of a problem and rather we report back that this matter continue to be reviewed for the next several years and perhaps reconvene this group at a date certain uh, in either 24 or 36 months to then make a recommendation if we see, if we see the matter uh, continue to move in that direction. I think I said this the last meeting, I'm still not clear on what we're looking for. You still have the 5%, so are we looking for a replacement for the 5%, as in getting rid of the franchise fee and replacing it with a different revenue stream, a supplement to that 5%? Um, and, and so what is the, what is the revenue requirement? What, what is the Pro forma look like for the next few years. Uh, we provided one year of financial information. So I think it was pointed out um, that is just one year, um, and uh, so I, I think I'm, I'm inter a little interested in hearing uh, a little more about what does the future look like in numbers. What, what do we expect to get next year for Peg Access Television? What do we need next year? Um, and uh, how that revenue would be used? The um, philosophy has been that, at least when we made this change, is that all the revenues from the sales tax should go to the education fund. If we start peeling off pieces of the sales tax for other purposes, uh, that's going that's going to uh, fly in the face of that uh, philosophy. So I would I would prefer to go in a direction other than a sales tax uh, for the purposes of raising any additional revenue. As far as whether it's supplementing or supplanting the 5% franchise fee, um, 
that's an issue that um, uh, I'm agnostic on, and uh, I, I think that uh, it, it really depends on how much money we're, we're trying to raise in addition to the 5%. And that seems kind of nebulous to me at the moment. So um, we, as I pointed out that we uh, <coughs> increased the, uh, U the Vermont USF fee by half a percent to provide uh, additional funds for connectivity. Um, we would be, with the connection fee, we would basically be uh, asking for an, another addition to it in order to provide for this. And uh, whether that's a, a, another half a percent or a quarter percent or, or something else or whether we put a flat we try to put a, a hybrid flat fee uh, in order to fund this uh, is, I think, open to discussion. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that the connection <coughs> fees um, option is pretty much the, uh, the best option before us, but I don't have strong feelings on uh, how to do that or, or whether it's appropriate. So that would be something to talk about more, I think. <coughs> so I think one of the things we're going to have to answer is how much revenue we would expect, we, we would want to be uh, targeting to come out of it. And um, I, I don't know what that number is, and I would have to ask the AMOs to tell me what they would expect, what they would project as far as the, the current revenue sources go, and um, what what the shortfall is going to be in terms of their operational and uh, maintenance costs. Anybody from AMOs want to comment on that or at this point? I think it, that might be good fodder for the public hearing because our expectations for the future of AMOs at a statewide AMO may I recognize Steve Whitaker for uh, yeah, the concerned citizen, right? It's uh, yes, it's a evolving landscape with the evolution of Vermont Access Network into a statewide AMO and Centra potentially centralized archiving. So one channel, high def, the evolution of the other channels to high def, which were delayed through this <coughs> stipulated settlement. There, I don't think we are at a place where we should assume costs are gonna remain the same. Uh, and that there could well be a significant need for increased revenue. Um, so in talking about the, uh, sorry, Elizabeth Malone from uh, in talking about what the effect will be on AMOs in the coming year as a result of the FCC order, that's not something the AMOs know. Only the cable companies are making that calculation, and only they know the fair market value that they're using in that calculation. So that wouldn't really, it's not anything we can answer. We're waiting to hear the answer. Well, I think we have something to say about, as we have, and you presented earlier, we're responding and since, you know, 2006. The increase in PEG costs has been related directly to com meeting community needs. So we're, we're driven by what community needs and interests are. We have an assessment of what we think those are going forward, which is why we think it's important to have this conversation about continuing funding. <coughs> so I think that there's a bigger strategic picture that you're referring to and that Van is holding that may be an $8 million picture, it might be a $20 million picture, and I think it's incumbent on us to reflect that back and have a sense. We may not have that in the next month, but I think that's important for us to paint that picture. And then I think the other side of it is there is this basket of um, charges that we as a state charge to either the users of the telecommunications, you know, broadly speaking, the users of the rights away, or the companies that 
run in the rights of way. Either it's kind of use tax or a kind of excise tax. And that's in a big basket. And that big basket includes PEG, includes the universal <laughs> service. You know, what's in universal service? So what authority does the state have to take that basket, make it one basket that funds all public benefit, right? I mean, and if, and if the state were to decide to reconstruct how that happened, either add to the USF or create another thing, that's a multi-year conversation. That's not a piece of legislation we're going to come up with in two months and think it's going to get passed in a year. You know, this is a longer policy deliberation about how to meet public interest and public benefit through the rights of way in a changing, rapidly changing environment. Because what we heard today is telephone revenue is going down, but software as a service is going up as a revenue source. You know, the whole picture is changing. And this has been helpful for us to understand that better. But, it, you know, we can attack PEG as a, like a one you know, one problem to be solved and or we can see it within the bigger context. And I think that these conversations point to a bigger context that may be a longer term but policy one, discussion. One of the things I've been thinking about is that uh, right now the AMOs are non-governmental entities. Um, and it's, I don't think it's the purview of the state to di dictate as to how they're organized. So for Van to become a uh, statewide AMO and then have just different branches throughout the state. Uh, that, that's something that I think needs to be decided by the AMOs themselves right. and not by the state. Right. And uh, <clears throat> so if we created a separate fund in order to, uh, in order or, or if we decided that we're going to allocate a certain amount of, uh, from the USF uh, to AMOs, uh, which do provide a benefit, in my opinion, to the, to the state in terms of uh, the uh, grassroots level democracy that we, that we uh, experience with recording of meetings and things like that and providing a voice for individual citizens to uh, to uh, get their opinions out on, on the air. And if we see that as a benefit, um, you know, we're, I don't, I don't want to, to get the state, in my opinion, I don't want to necessarily get the state involved in regulating the AMOs, but um, if we can help in some way, you know, we should try to do that. Well, it sounds like we have a date change, and then we have some sort of what the purview of the public hearing is going to be. Yep. And if that time is actually the right time to do that public hearing, I'd for us to have more discussion. Right. Yeah. So, uh, could we expect from um, from Van uh, a kind of an estimate about how much revenue we would want to raise if we were going to uh, supplement the 5% uh, for the next meeting for discussion purposes. It would be helpful to know what our losses will be for the coming year mm -hmm. as a result of the FCC ruling. I don't, I don't know when you're going to be ready to provide us with those numbers. Yeah, I, I don't anticipate losses. So uh, we, we haven't looked at this statement from NECTA, and I don't know if it addresses that, but uh, would this, Dan, would this uh, pick on memo address what uh, you expect in terms of? Uh, no, they, that, memo doesn't, that, that, that memo doesn't cover that. Uh, I think they're talking about the 621 order. That's still a matter that's being, there's a, there's a whole host of issues surrounding it. Uh, in resolution of our uh, general issues uh, uh, pertaining to the CPG, we anticipate that uh, revenues uh, will remain consistent with what they have been uh, over, over the past several years. 
So we don't have in-kind costs in Vermont that you would subtract from the that you anticipate you would subtract from the franchise fee. Well, I don't know that for certain. There are some, uh, but uh, we we outlined some of this in the uh, resolution order uh, that we, or the re resolution settlement that we that we signed together. Mm -hmm. So, I, I I I don't see a, 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 a huge discussion on that mm -hmm. going forward. If there are uh, in kind provisions that are specifically further. Uh, outlined and determined, that will be a different discussion. But pertaining to how we resolve the matter, we're, we're very clear on those issues. Right. I think what Elizabeth's pointing to is this: is are there in kind are there in kind services that you provide in Vermont that we're not aware of that you would then say when we sit down to negotiate, are we going to subtract that from your the franchise fee? You see what I mean? Like there may be things that we just don't know what you're giving in kind or, or counting against that you would count against the cable because you have latitude to do that, right? The FCC has said. Well, the decision was very clear uh, on what the provisions are, and even the courtesy services were outlined in the settlement agreement. Mm -hmm. So. So you don't expect that there will be subtraction from the current franchise fee funding that we have. I don't want you to put words in my mouth. No. There, okay. hasn't, uh, there, there hasn't been a full determination pertaining uh, to all of those issues surrounding the order and review of that. Okay. Uh, but based upon where we stand today with the resolution of the CPG issues, uh, we don't anticipate uh, offset resulting from that. Okay. So we will... We'll provide a picture at the next meeting of where we think it's going. Okay. I mean, I think you could start with a level funding assumption. Is it would be good to replace five percent of, you know, the equivalent eight million or how that builds up? But I think, I mean, you could add anything onto that mm -hmm. number. But I think what we what we're finding out is that these other revenue sources. You know, you got four million on satellite. You got two million on this. I mean, there are very few revenue sources right now that are anywhere near the eight mil, right? So whatever percentage you would have to add on the universal service fund, presuming that you're not charging a franchise fee to customers, you know, they're still going to be paying one way or the other. But that might be a pretty significant percentage to come up with that amount of money. I, yeah. So joint fiscal might be able to help us with some number crunching, but you know. These are big numbers. Can I ask for one more follow-up, too, yeah. or, or, sure. on what the AMOs provided? I did notice in the uh, information that was provided that there was a 40% incremental increase in programming. Mm -hmm. If we could get some specifics on where that lies, I think that would be helpful, uh, whether it's locally produced original programming. Yeah. And then uh, I also noticed, you correct me if I'm wrong in this, that during that same period of time, there was a 70% increase in uh, uh, human capital resources. Mm -hmm. So if there's a 70% increase in that regard, how did that figure into only a 40% increase in programming, and what is that difference in the 30% increase in human resource funding? What is, that being, what is that being utilized for? Well, I think just generally, programming isn't the only thing we do, mm -hmm. right? So there's, you, so I don't think it's a straight line between okay. staff and programming because the staff is helping people produce programming, producing programming, training, operating, you know, they're doing a whole variety of buying equipment, the whole talking to you. I mean, like we're doing all kinds of things. So I'm not sure that there is a straight line. And I think it would be safe to say that that's an increase in locally produced programming out of the facilities, not programming that is being imported to us. For programming, we when we did that analysis, we only looked at locally produced programs. Right. So I think, you know, we're providing a basket of community services that isn't just execution. And uh, <clears throat> when we increased the uh, USF by 0.4%, how much revenue did that generate? It, it seems to me like it was like 1.2 million. 1.2 million? I believe that was the estimate we got last year. Okay. Yeah. Last session. I think it's actually a little bit. I think the, well, I mean, I guess we could sit here and do the math because it's about five and a half percent, or excuse me, five and a half million at two percent. I think for the connectivity initiative, we're estimating between 
six and seven hundred thousand dollars, and then we have the position, which is one hundred and twenty. So somewhere around a million, a little less, maybe. So if we were going to supplant the um, franchise fee with the uh, Vermont USF fee, well, we're talking about a uh, increase in the USF fee of three percent, three percent at least. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it'd be going from. 2.54 percent up to about five and a half percent. So that's that's a major consideration when we're doing legislation. <laughs> and it's not accrued on cable. Yeah, we, we we saw what happened last year when we when we tried to increase the fuel tax by two cents. Yeah. Immediately we were doubling it. Yeah, it doesn't sound like it would be a replacement, yeah. right? It, it would be it would a replacement, but that wouldn't matter because the opposition would say, well, we're doubling the French, the uh, USF fee, and that's where the uh, uh, that's where the opposition would come in and the spin. Uh, so we have to be also mindful of what we could accomplish in the legislature as well. So can I be re reinforce one statement <coughs> with regard to offset? I want to be really clear that with regard to the CPG, as I stated, that there we were very clear to itemize that in the settlement provisions. Uh, so I don't want to, I don't do forward-looking uh, statements with regard to this because I just don't know what lies there. But by the set, the flip side of that is that there is no plan in place, uh, there is no uh, agenda in that regard, and uh, so I don't want to send out the message that that there is some. Uh, that there is something that is going to happen because at this juncture there simply isn't. Thank you for your clarification. Yep. Did you want to finish your thought on the USF? Yeah, my what I was trying to get at was that when when you just explained it, um, it one option would be to increase the, to the three percent, in which case that would supplant the cable franchise fee and another option would be to just make it a smaller percentage that would be tied to some incremental amount that um, would additionally fund. I don't see that being as more viable than Yeah. And so so one thing that just the the community needs assessment have folks tied any sort of monetary value to you know what it would take to implement you know the highest level of meeting the needs or you, you know some, some just trying to get to what you raised about um, you know what's the what's the, what's the difference what are we looking to 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 do here to to fulfill some additional need um, to take into account what you said about um, the you know the next couple of years looking okay you know like is there a horizon you know 20 year um, plan that has been um, <coughs> that's a good so question I, I, and you know it's sort of like pie in the sky sort of thing so how much effort do you really put into that and you know well that's you know that's a planning function which we can always be aided by by the department when we look at these things, but we have not done a 20-year plan. I think we have been in, oh my goodness, mm -hmm. mode, right? And now we're starting to turn our attention to those longer-term horizons. But there is a direct line between our identification of community needs and what our budgets are. Okay. We always start with community needs assessments, and those drive what our operating capital budgets are. Right. Within reason, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, you can't meet all the needs, but we're very connected to what those assessments are. So the budgets that we propose or the funding levels that we require are not based on, oh, we'll ask for ten and hope we get five. It's, right. This is a unit cost analysis based on community needs that each of these centers conduct. So can can they take the next step and say, if we were to meet these other needs, it would cost this much more money? Um, is that I think, something that could I think be the done? question is what are the other needs? Yeah. What would you put in that basket? Would you put in a statewide? I mean, for example. And how to quantify it, too. Right. I mean, as an example, Comcast has 
offered us a statewide HD channel, and that will cost something. And that's going to cost something to operate, <laughs> yeah. and we're going to have to figure out the way to generate additional revenue over above what we have to pay for the, you know, in addition to the playback funding that we've received, how to do that. So it really depends on the aspirations of the group, and also the diversification of revenue is a real thing. Like we know we have to diversify. The franchise fee is not going to be the only revenue source going forward. So all of these things are in play, and I don't think, we know that we've got an $8 million hole potentially to fill. We know it's not going to be tomorrow, but we know that it's coming. And we need to be prepared as a state from a policy perspective and as AMOs from a uh, smart business perspective. Right. And I think one other key factor, you raised some valid points, that the the whole nature of community needs and interests is defined <coughs> under the federal law, and it's determining what those community needs and interests are, but a key piece to the federal law is also while well, considering the costs of meeting those needs. And the department, during our CPG renewal, as well as uh, providers, do individual needs assessments as well through independent survey taking. And one of, the cons one of the considerations taken into account is what price consumers are willing to bear in order to meet these needs. So some of that data exists today, but I think it's an important and integral piece that we need to consider as a group going forward. Yeah. And I think how you <coughs> interpret the data is always where we get into sure. the thing, but the fact is, is that there is price sensitivity on the part of the consumer, and we're very aware of that. <coughs> so that whole willingness to pay thing, is that something that we could talk about at our next meeting? Um, sure, we have some data, <coughs> but I mean, Laura Glenn raises a valid point. It's subject to interpretation on, on how questions, uh, types of questions. Uh, we're not going to sit here and deny that when you ask people if they want to pay more money, what the general sure. answer is to it. But I do think it is the federal standard and has some validity for consideration and conversation. Yeah.